welcome to Navarra FM. My name is Richard Holmes. Of all the metonyms in all the world, perhaps none got more of what it wanted from the 20th century than Silicon Valley. But what is underneath this name? Silicon Valley is a place, of course, but it's vastly more than that. It's the world's most important mass of tech and money. It's become a style of life, a particular view of history, and even an approach to politics. These politics seemed clear around a decade ago. Technocratic neoliberalism meets a bland futurism and never mind the racism. But since then, the politics of the tech sector have got more and more complicated and seemingly further and further to the right. Recently, prominent figures in the valley have come out in favour of Donald Trump, and it's not just the usual spooky suspects. With the 2024 US election coming now into view, the shifting beliefs of a few unelected, ultra-powerful tech billionaires matter more than they ever have before. So where do they come from? There is perhaps no one more capable of speaking about the buried dark side of the valley than Malcolm Harris, author of Paolo Alto, A History of California, Capitalism and the World. Over 700 immaculately researched pages He documents the transformation of this chunk of California, from the genocide that helped found the place to its present role in, well, facilitating genocide, and letting you listen to this. Following on in the noble tradition of interviews, such as that between Elon Musk and Donald Trump, I asked him how to understand the rise of right-wing billionaires, what to make of all the hype around AI, and in suitably Californian mind-expanding style, where the machines themselves have politics. Uh, welcome to Navarro FM. Thank you so much for having me. So there is a famous book called Capital. All listeners' minds will have immediately jumped to uh, the Thomas Piketty book, Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, but I don't mean that one. Uh, and I don't mean also the book by Karl Marx. The book that I mean is Kenneth Goldsmith's Capital. The premise of the book is that the capital of the 20th century is a city, um, and that city is New York. And so the book consists of quotations, reflections, ideas, phrases about New York as a place. And in some sense, your book, Paolo Alto, is an attempt to refute this idea that New York uh, could be a kind of a capital of the 20th century. Maybe culturally speaking, it is, but there is a deeper layer of infrastructure, a deeper layer of technological progress that perhaps defines the the 20th century more profoundly than its cultural output does. And that place is, of course, Palo Alto and the the, the surrounding uh, Silicon Valley. And so my very simple opening question is, why should we care about this place? Like, what is it in this place that defines our world? Yeah, when I first started writing about it, I assumed that everyone would say like this place is not so important you know you need to talk about maybe you mean san francisco uh, but this is just like a place that you're from and it doesn't really matter Uh, but the more i actually researched palo alto and its role in the expansion of anglo-american capitalism in california and in the west and then around the world it really is this this hinge point for world history where california goes from being the the furthest hinterlands of the global system, um, you know, really difficult to colonize, really on the edge of the world, uh, as far as most people were concerned, to being the real center of a whole new global system that completes this sort of hinge across the Pacific. And Palo Alto plays a a leading role in that, uh, much more so than, say, Los Angeles, which, though it hasn't gotten the same uh, amount of attention as Los Angeles, in terms of the like politics, uh, history, economics, certainly technology, uh, a lot of it's really coming out of the Bay Area and Palo Alto in particular. You've come on before to talk about that. I recommend listeners go and check out the ACFM episode with Kia Milburn, uh, which is about Californian capitalism and sort of the, the Palo Alto system that um, was invented there. So give me a sense of physically where we are. I've never been to Silicon Valley. I've never been to uh, California. I was um, reading your book and looking up all the places involved. And they are all within like a half an hour drive of each other, which was astonishing to me uh, that so much happened in this little kind of uh, piece of the world. When we're thinking about Silicon Valley, uh, 
and we're trying to get its temperature or we're trying to understand where it's at culturally, where should we be looking? Like what concretely are the indicators that give us a sense of how the culture is changing, shifting? Is it the all-in podcast? Is it like crypto markets? Is it Magnificent Seven stocks? Like where concretely should we be looking when we're trying to keep track of what this industry is doing? Where should we be looking to understand tech? I think we need to look at the military and I think we look at, need to look at the shift into prime contracting by tech companies, which I hope we get a chance to talk about more later. Um, but this is the the real important and significant shift that I've seen in my research that I think stuff like cryptocurrency that we've been talking about, um, a number of them are really like a repetition of the same Silicon Valley pattern, the same, whether it's the dot-com boom or the internet boom, you know, whatever sort of gold rush uh, narrative that they're just running it again and again and again and again. But I think the shift by large tech companies into being prime contractors for the US military uh, is a notable historical shift. And that's something we have to try and understand and put in con the correct historical context. The impetus for this particular episode was that something quite strange seemed to be starting to happen inside the 2024 presidential race. Uh, and that thing was that there was suddenly seen to be an influx or a surge of support for Donald Trump and his candidacy for president coming out of San Francisco and Silicon Valley and the surrounding area. We think of those places as traditionally solidly Democrat, right? We think of the politics of those places as Democrat. And so I want to sort of ask two questions. Firstly, is it right to think of them as, as Democrat? Like just from a sort of a polling perspective, if we think about who lives there, how they're likely to vote, are those really the politics or is there a sort of conservative undercurrent that has been pushing through that whole history? And secondly, is this even the right way to think about politics in a place like Silicon Valley at all, where yes, there are people, but in some ways the people are secondary to an amassed infrastructure of technological development and a amassed pool of capital that has its own whims, its own uh, drives in the world. And so should we rather not think about merely who lives in Silicon Valley, but the politics of Silicon Valley in a much broader sense is encompassing that technical and financial infrastructure as, as well. So there's a, sort of two stacked questions. Yeah, I think it's important to distinguish between the, the owners um, in the sector, in, in the tech world, and the workers. So tech workers, people who work for tech companies, tend to support Democrats overwhelmingly. They vote for Democrats. They give money for Democrat to Democrats. If you you know work for Google, odds are you're a Democrat. Odds are you are uh, disproportionately supportive of Democrats. Um, and so I think that's what people, when they think of like, oh, California is liberal, the Bay Area is particularly liberal. They're thinking of these masses of people who work there in various jobs and tend to support Democratic candidates. And that's why um, you have someone like Nancy Pelosi representing the area for a very long time. Um, uh, Kamala Harris obviously comes out of the, the state, um, you do the left coast, right? Uh, but that's very different than the politics of the, the most celebrated men. And I should say men, it's not all men, but it's, it's mostly men um, who lead this industry and uh, stand for it in the public mind. And they tend to be very conservative, not just like sort of conservative, but like very, 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 very conservative. Not all of them. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg's a pretty like down the road. Uh, Republicans and Democrats both go on Facebook kind of guy. Yep. But you see these figures and lately we've been talking about Elon Musk, uh, Peter Thiel, maybe David Sachs is one, uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, who are vocal and and very, very conservative, and not just in a Republican conservative way, but in a like broader, uh, broader sense. And that's why it's hard to think about it just in terms of like Republicans and Democrats, because the political lines um, that they're sketching don't necessarily fall within those parties, and they don't necessarily think of themselves as uh, predominantly like representatives of these party structures. So I talk about uh, Herbert Hoover, who's really a, a f important figure in the history of the Bay industry and is really the like guy who is this conservative leader. He becomes president of the United States at a certain point. But when he's first re running for president of the United States, the reporters ask him what party he belongs to and he can't answer them. He doesn't know. 
Uh, he says, like, I'm a liberal or whatever. Uh, and that's partly because he hadn't lived in the United States for a very long time. But I think it's mostly because the politics aren't uh, adequately described by either of those partisan labels. And so you also see people who are extremely conservative who say, oh, I'm not a Republican. I don't believe in all that. I believe in something completely different. And they use this to sort of frame themselves as something other than conservative or other than right wing, when really it means they're they're very, very right wing in ways that are important. Of course, the traditional left right distinction, as listeners of this program will almost certainly know, is formed in the French Revolution. And of course, we're thinking about uh, a state that is founded uh, substantially developed, of course, uh, the original population is genocided. Uh, 100 years after that, and we're now 150 years after that genocide uh, and the founding of California. And this might be part of the sort of the myth or the idea of California, and I wonder what you think about it, is that, yeah, sure, we had a left and a right. Um, we had a sort of a liberals and conservatives. We had all these kind of distinctions that uh, dominated in politics in the 19th and 20th centuries. But this is a different place, right? And now we have computers, and now we have technology, and now we have, you know, the sun is always shining. You know, we have a totally different kind of environment. And all these fusty, old, you know, dusty European abstractions from the 19th and 20th centuries, we no longer have a sort of need of these. And one moment you might sort of pick out of that from recent history is Yang Gang uh, and the, the candidacy of Andrew Yang for the president. And I'm sort of wondering, like, convince me that I should care about these old European abstractions, I guess, from the standpoint of someone who is skeptical of things like Marxism. Yeah, and this has always been the promise of going West for settlers. And that's why it's important to think about California as a settler colony, um, and really at, at the beginning for the United States, an overseas settler colony that's more akin to like Algeria for the French um, than anything else. It's a, the same time period. California is definitely further from DC than Algeria is from Paris, right? And you really did have to take a boat at the time in the mid-19th century to, to go to California. And what the settler colony represented um, through its gold first and then through the possibility of land um, is the ability to uh, render the, these old divisions um, unnecessary. To say like, sure, you, were, you might be, they may be trying to coerce you into being a, a wage worker, a wage slave out east, but here in the west, you can, you know, make your own land, you make your own place. You can uh, take this land and make something of it. But the truth was the people who were settling on this land um, were, were capitalists. This was global capitalism, even in the mid 19th century. And so they weren't like settling on that land to be human farmers and like, you know, cultivate their, their little patch of garden or whatever. Uh, they would take their their you know state given rights to territory and license them to the timber companies, license, license them to a gold mine. Right? It was this was a form of passive income that you were entitled to uh, as a as a settler and as specifically as an Anglo American settler. Right? And so those those fusty abstractions, um, some of which are included like race and nationality. Right? We think of them as as fusty abstractions, but they're they're modern. They're very modern abstractions that were in some ways created um, at that time and in those places in order to divide people. So the the at a time where like wage labor wasn't yet universal, um, people had to be coerced into wage labor. And one of the ways in which you did that was to cut the indigenous people off from their uh, ability to reproduce themselves off the land, uh, which is something the settlers obviously did, but also to coerce uh, different kinds of people into different labor relations based on new divisions that were invented. And so a lot of the like jurisprudence about race in the United States comes out of this period in California at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, not back in the 1800s, back in the 1700s, but the question of like, okay, is an immigrant from India considered white? Is an immigrant from Japan considered white? And white doesn't just mean, you know, you get a, a gold star for being a white person. It means like rights, you know, the right to testify in court, which was crucial. Because if you think about what, well, if you don't have the right to testify in court, you don't have any other rights, period. Um, you can't say like that guy stole from me if the court won't hear what you're saying. And that was the law in California at the time. Uh, and so these, these techniques of division weren't just like something that California was 
falling into or definitely not trying to escape from, but something the state itself was trying to pioneer. Um, and that's where ultimately this, this relation between workers and capital uh, was developed for the United States. It wasn't something that uh, was already built that California just took on. California played a major role um, in constructing labor relations in the United States into the 20th century. I'm going to put my devil's uh, advocate hat on here and say that you're absolutely right about all the, the history, of course, there. But now we have um, you know, Silicon Valley CEOs. Uh, quite a large number of them are uh, Indian American. Part, quite a large number of them are uh, Asian American. Uh, we have a, you know, a Californian uh, presidential candidate who is a woman of Indian and black uh, heritage, right? Aren't those are those things in the past? Isn't the uh, dream of Californian sort of post-racial politics, if not fully realized, at least well on its way to being completed? Uh, no, uh, straight up no. You shock me. <laughs> yeah, shocking, shocking answer. Uh, the H one B visa program, in which like um, talented quote unquote uh, immigrants are allowed to come and conditionally work, has been a very very powerful tool for Silicon Valley, and it's no different than these past uh, ways of controlling labor and ways of managing labor. In fact, labor management through immigration um, is something that California has made a really one of its specialties over time. And that doesn't stop at the end of the, the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. It continues all the way through. So there's a huge, the biggest Vietnamese population in the country is in the South Bay. Um, and that's not a coincidence. It's because people were fleeing Vietnam at a time when there was growth industry in the Bay Area. Well, why was there growth industry in the Bay Area? Because there was a war on Vietnam, uh, which required a bunch of electronics components. And so there was huge growth in this electronics industry because of the war. The war also displaces a huge number of people. In, and where are you going to come? You're going to come to somewhere with economic opportunity. You're going to come to somewhere that's growing and that happens to be on the, the Pacific coast. Uh, and a lot of those workers were incorporated. Um, one of the biggest hirers, hiring uh, firms for those workers was Hewlett Packard, which was not only a huge defense subcontractor during the war, uh, Packard himself was deputy secretary of defense for Nixon from 69 to 71. And so he's like, you know, benefiting from these workers that he has, you know, really worked to displace. Um, and you can look at the collapse of the Soviet Union similarly, right? That the, the arms race that was operated out of Palo Alto, like really out of Palo Alto, um, put the Soviet Union in a place where it could no longer reproduce itself. And one of the big winners of the collapse of the Soviet Union was the Bay Area tech industry, which took a ton, a ton of immigrants um, who were highly qualified that the Soviet Union had spent tons and tons of time educating you know, building their human capital. And you had this huge brain drain and skill drain out of uh, the Soviet Union, also of hockey players. So like the San Jose hockey team gets really good in large part thanks to the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, which is the same thing that happens to a bunch of these tech companies who are able to take a lot of these immigrants. Um, and again, like that hurts Russia, right? That hurts Russia's ability to build itself as a country if all of the most talented people uh, or many of the most talented people get sucked into Palo Alto one way or the other. So like Sergey Brin is, is part of that generation of Soviet, post-Soviet immigrants. Um, and he ends up at the University of Maryland, which is where I attended as well, uh, where his father is a, a math professor. But he ends up, even though he does not you know, immigrating to the Bay, like people might have been fleeing from Vietnam, he still ends up there, right? And he plays a very important role in the growth of Silicon Valley. Uh, but that's not an equalizing force for the world, right? That's, that's once again, the industry using its advantages um, to stay on top of the rest of the world. Otherwise, you'd have equalization. And so you think of like, well, there are all these great, you know, highly skilled, uh, like Indian CEOs, uh, who have immigrated and run companies in the Bay Area. And it's like, well, was, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of individual freedom of movement. Uh, I don't believe in borders. And at the same time, you have to think like, well, isn't there a need for development in other places? Like, don't, don't you want a, a, a tech industry in India? And in fact, yes, they've spent tons and tons and tons of resources 
uh, educating and building this capacity only for Palo Alto to come and try and skim the cream off the top uh, without really coming up with any obligations to the people themselves that they're pulling in and trying out. Um, so I think this, this pattern is something we can see built up over time. Um, and we can't see labor and capital and the relation between them outside of the, these confounding relations about uh, race and gender and nationality and immigration status, um, not just as a point of like, you know, analytic consistency or whatever, but in terms of uh, trying to understand what's happened and, and, and usefully abstract from it. Why don't Silicon Valley workers think of themselves as workers? Some of them make too much money. Some of them have uh, a literal stake in the company, and they associate themselves with the, their stock options rather than themselves as, as exploited workers. Um, but I think that's changing. And I think Silicon Valley workers on the tech side, and, you know, the maintenance workers and janitorial workers have, have historically understood their position a little bit better. But I think that now we see uh, more engineers, more people within the industry start to understand that they're not, you know, temporarily embarrassed billionaires, but they're actually like people with jobs and that their interests could be better uh, represented by organizing with fellow workers rather than by trying to move up the ladder. Before I get to the sort of the the contemporary question, which is like, how do we understand the politics that are going into this particular election? I want to come back to something you said a bit earlier, which was this thing about um, Mark Zuckerberg thinking that both Democrats and Republicans use Facebook. And obviously that's that's correct. And the sort of more general point there is perhaps something like there are distinct fractions of Silicon Valley. It's not a sort of singular uh, place, but a whole bunch of different kinds of technological development require different kinds of politics. They, they require different kinds of centrism. They require different kinds of immigration regime. They require different kinds of government investment. They require different kinds of tariffs and so on. And so all these different sort of policy levers are things that different sections of Silicon Valley might want differently. Very differently, for example, crypto on the one hand to like the new fledgling space industry to what we might think of as like Metacalf or Metcalf sort of companies like Facebook, whose reliance is on building this sort of like general network that includes ultimately sort of everyone. And so I was wondering if you could speak to how significant you think those kinds of distinctions are in having helping us understand the politics of Silicon Valley. Like, does it matter what the technology actually is, how it actually operates? Um, maybe somewhat. I, I think like um, someone like Mark Zuckerberg is aware that his products are very sensitive to public vibes. And if Facebook becomes uncool or whatever, people can leave. Or if it becomes politically problematic, people can leave. Um, but at the same time, you see Elon Musk uh, is taking a, a totally opposite tack um, with his companies, even though something like Tesla is very dependent on uh, brand favorability. And he's trying to sell electric vehicles to people who want to buy electric vehicles. So trying to sell electric vehicles as a like right wing figurehead is a very strange, you know, economic decision to make in some ways. And from a pure economic perspective, probably not a very good one, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg is probably a better businessman in some ways than uh, Elon Musk is. But at the same time, you see, um, the appeals from some of these companies are to their very, very small number of clients um, that are more important. So someone like Larry Ellison, who I think is under-discussed, who's the, the founder and CEO of Oracle, who's one of the richest, men, richest, most powerful men in the world, definitely. He's the like database provider for a number of governmental and non-governmental uh, systems, including like the U.S. intelligence system. And ICE, right? Didn't he offer to provides yeah and you know. ice and and you know he's running the the heritage foundation project 2025 database and you know he's doing he's he's all the way out there um uh, but he, and he's aware that his contracts are with the government and with um companies large companies and he understands that a more right-wing situation is better for his company and so after 9-11 he, he went out there and he was really pushing hard for a national ID program that would be mandatory for immigrants so that people could go and check people's papers. And the United States has never had a 
digital database that had everyone's information. There is no di national digital ID database. It does not exist. People have been trying to create it since the technology to create it has existed. And over and over again, um, it's crashed because people don't want it, right? It, it, like most people don't want there to be a database of all the people um, with all of our information that the government has. And they're aware of this, how this could be misused. Uh, but Ellison was was also aware that this like right wing security conscious moment could be very, very profitable for him. And so he wasn't worried about like, oh, if I come out for a national ID program, which is classically unpopular across the across the political spectrum. People, Americans just do not like this idea. He wasn't worried about like, oh, if I do this, then people aren't going to want to use Oracle products or whatever. Uh, he was worried about the political conditions that favor him as a capitalist. And I think Elon Musk and, and others are, are doing the same thing, especially when through their support for Donald Trump, there's an understanding that a Trump administration would be better for them as business owners, period, as capitalists, period, um, than that their advocacy for this position would hurt them in the public uh, mind. Um, whether they're right or not, like I, I don't, I don't know. But I think that's the bet that they're making is that they understand that uh, a conservative situation is better for them. Period. Mm. There's also a sort of another aspect to Larry Ellison's politics, which is that he's um, very strongly in favor of Israel, right, uh, yep. and, and against the Palestinians. And I, I'm kind of interested in whether or not there are broader comparisons we could make here between. California and Israel. Israel likes to present itself as a sort of a, a startup nation. Obviously, in some ways, it's quite liberal. For example, like LGBT rights and so on in certain parts of you know, Tel Aviv are probably uh, more advanced than um, lots of places in, in, in the world. And yet, at the same time, of course, this comes at the cost of mass incarceration. It comes at the cost of uh, genocide. It comes at the cost of spending a lot of capital on weaponry. It comes at the cost of an extremely advanced surveillance apparatus, all of which we can see are as sort of, you know, Californian functions as well. And I'm sort of wondering if you think that's an excessively, like, close sort of comparison. I'm wondering what kind of comparisons you think we could make there between Israel on the one hand and and California on the other. I think we could make more comparisons than that. I mean, it really Israel is a settler colony in the mode of 19th century California, um, one that has been thus far less successful at controlling its own territory and exterminating and controlling the native population. Um, so I, th I think that not just like analogies, but you can look at like real overlaps. So like the guy who designed California's uh, water system, uh, this guy named Mead, uh, he's, there's a big lake that provides uh, California's water. It's called Mead Lake that's named after him. He's a, he's a water systems engineer. Uh, he goes over to uh, the, the Palestine, Palestine concession, right, when it's still British controlled at the time, and is doing water system engineering over there. Um, so we're talking about like the same, like literal personnel, um, especially when it comes to water, water system engineering, but not just water system engineering, um, mining engineering in general and, and, uh, infrastructure for settlement, uh, during this period. And so like Israel is also a 19th century settler colony. Um, it just like took a while to find its current form, right? If we think of like, if California were in, had broken from the United States to be its own settler colony. Maybe its timeline would be more adjacent to Israel. Uh, but I think Israel also understands the relationship between the tech industry um, and global geopolitics. And they understand that this, this settler, settler colonialism um, and the, the use of weapons to accomplish political goals is much more closely tied to the tech industry's fortunes than people imagine. Um, and people, Tech advances of the 60s, for example, are, are associated with um, moon tra lunar travel, right? It's like, mm. oh, yeah, we built, we built the microchips so that we could go to the moon. Like, that's false. We built the microchips so we could put them on nuclear missiles. That's what they were for. That's what they did. The entire first generation of silicon chips uh, went into ICBMs, um, and those were guns pointed at the world's head. Uh, and Israel understands that, and that's why Israel's like whole tech industry is really based around its military and comes 
directly out of the military, uh, military technologies, its main like uh, product, um, which is why it's really awkward that all that technology failed so miserably on October 7th, which was this like, you know, demo day for the the fact that these tech systems, tech defense systems that were supposed to be magic and supposed to, you know, reduce the need for previous forms of domination. You know, we could just have an electrical fence uh, that's digital in some way. We don't need like border guards um, was proven incorrect. And now we see what the tech industry is really, 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 really about, which is building bombs to drop on people. I guess I would suggest that although it is true that microprocessors were put in ICBMs, right? Like the fact is that microprocessors are also extremely general purpose technologies that could be used for a whole collection of other things. Although people who, I mean, I, I agree with you about the point about uh, Israel as a sort of exporter of technologies. And certainly the politics of that were something that we talked about on this show. There's a show with uh, Rivka Brown and Antti Lonstein called Palestine as Showroom, in which they talk through this sort of dynamic of the way in which Israel has used its domination of the Palestinians as a kind of a, yeah, a showroom basically for its technologies. Yeah, Anthony Lonstein's book, uh, The Palestine Laboratory, looks at this very specifically about how they've use the occupied territories, not just as a like place of experiment to try and test their own tools, but to advertise them to other countries in the world. And again, like it's true that, that microchips and, and silicon chips and, and transistors and all and these, these tools were, have been used for a number of things, including, you know, me talking to you right now, but we really shouldn't underrate how much they were used consistently through this whole history as tools of oppression. When we think of communications technology in the 70s and the 80s or whatever, again, exported by Hewlett Packard, let's say, uh, they were sending signals intercept technology to the Shah of Iran, right? And that was used by Savak uh, to crack down on domestic dissent. And so that's that's still these, these tools being used for these things. You know, if you're sending computer systems to Pinochet, where they, the secret police can write names down, uh, like that's still a weapon. Right, even though it's a just a database tool, it's being used in this world war, um, and you can find examples of these like consistently all through this history. Right, one was the first use of the like the first big public use of the keyhole satellite system that we think of as Google Maps right now was like during the invasion of Iraq. Um, so there's no there's no point at which the industry sort of departs from the defense uh, aspect of its development. There's no point where like, and this is a story that tech likes to tell about itself, which is that, oh, we were we were funded by the military. Yeah, th that was military research, but then, then we made a bunch of money and we went off into the market and that's different from the military. And so we weren't doing that anymore. Now we were doing communications technology. Everyone likes communications technology. It's like, well, actually communications technology is also weapons, right? Um, and so people need to not just hear the, the advertising that's coming out of the industry itself, the stories it tells about itself, but like a lot of other stories. And if you look at history and the, you can go back to watch like uh, a thriller movies from the seventies and eighties, it's always about some chip. There's always some chip that the people are like fighting over or trying to kill each other over or is the center of this intrigue. It's always some piece of technology um, that people are spying over and, and, Silicon Valley has been full of spies um, for many, many, many decades now uh, because it is a, a center of military industry. Um, so that that line is much more consistent than people think it is. And I don't blame them for thinking otherwise. It, it's been real propaganda effort. The counterexample to the Pinochet's secret police using computers to write down names is, of course, CyberSyn, right? So on the one hand, you have this sort of like um, constricting possibility. On the other hand, it opens up. We could go back and we could go back through that sort of, uh, you know, listing examples and counterexamples, I guess, more or less indefinitely. Speaking of uh, spies, though, in Ukraine, there we have a situation now in which um, SpaceX has become a major uh, contractor for the US government. Mm -hmm. It's now essentially determining who can and cannot use certain kinds of satellite infrastructure in that ongoing war. And so we have a situation in which the most powerful military alliance in world history, NATO, is having to rely not only on a 
private company, but also on the whims of a single, extraordinarily powerful single man, Elon Musk, to determine whether or not they can use you know, uh, their infrastructure in, in, in a particular way. Is that situation unprecedented? Is that surprising? Does anything in the history of Silicon Valley point us towards this kind of individualistic and individual power over such extraordinary apparatuses? That actually is is an important change, and it's important that people understand that that shift. Because for a long time, for a very long time, really since um, since FDR won the election in 1932, really Silicon Valley has been suspicious of the American federal government, and part of that has to do with uh, corporate consolidation that happens during the New Deal period and during World War II. Um, where some of these like West Coast gadget makers get sort of um, involuntarily conscripted into the national effort in ways that they didn't want. And sometimes that could mean like actually losing control of your own company because the government said so. And this is a like formative trauma for the tech industry, uh, even though I don't think they like really know this history very well. They, they know it's there. Like they know the government and that the East Coast, Wall Street, whatever, like someone tried to take something from them once upon a time. And since then, uh, Silicon Valley and tech companies in particular have kept their distance um, from the feds in very specific ways where they've chosen to operate as subcontractors for the government rather than uh, what we call prime contractors. So instead of selling their signals technology directly to the government, they sell their tools to Boeing, who puts them in a plane, who sells it to the government. And that allowed these tech companies to still keep the government dependent on them. Like they needed those products to be on the shelf, um, but with a little, little distance so that they weren't under federal control uh, in a way that they feared. Now, this has changed, and this has changed since then. Um, I think it's you can point to the election of George W. Bush, actually, and the appointment of John Ashcroft as his attorney general, who was a real pro-tech guy um, and built important relations with tech, especially after 9-11. Uh, but I think even more recently, you could look at Peter Thiel's uh, confab that he uh, brought together after Donald Trump was elected, where he brought these like leading tech figures all in one room, and Trump said, not what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? You know, how can I make the tech industry uh, go long, I think is his phrase, was the phrase that he used. And after that, this meeting, after Trump's election, you see these companies moving into that prime contractor category, um, where not just Elon Musk, but uh, with SpaceX um, and whatever other uh, I'm not sure exactly how his his internet company is is categorized within his uh, corporate regimes or whatever, um, but Google, um, Facebook, you know, whatever whatever large tech company you can think of, is finding ways to contract directly with the federal government now, um, and particularly around defense projects, and that has caused problems for some of these companies um, internally. So there have been big projects, uh, big protests, excuse me, at Google around drone imaging, um, this project called Project Maven, where workers did not want their work going towards uh, government drone targeting um, and were able to, to pull that contract. Uh, but this is, this is a, a real shift. And one of the issues with making that shift under the auspices of the tech leaders themselves rather than under the auspices of the government or under democracy is that they maintain their uh, their privileges and their their ability to control the systems that they're operating. And at the same time, uh, just structurally economically, we've seen the rise of privately controlled firms relative uh, to publicly controlled firms that you see a bunch of these firms that, and even the ones that might be uh, publicly traded, still in terms of operational control, um, are still run by their founders, are still run by like individual men like Elon Musk. So that even though that Elon Musk's company is not all of them, but a number of them have shareholders and uh, you know that he's theoretically publicly responsible to, uh, the share setup of these companies separates control and ownership and keeps control isolated among a small number of people. So like Mark Zuckerberg still has 
phenomenal amounts of control. His amount of control over the company vastly exceeds his monetary control over the company. Uh, and the same thing is true of Elon Musk, right? It's like your, your operational control over the company vastly exceeds your, your monetary control of the company. Uh, and that leads to these like pretty bizarre and yeah, historically unprecedented situations where Elon Musk is going in and like changing the settings on his software to affect the outcome of like geopolitical events. I can, I don't think you can point to a, an event like that in the history of the industry. Rather, it points to the like culmination of a century long effort to rejigger this relationship between the industry and tech or between the industry and the state and get it back to something like it was under Hoover, where you had the industry uh, being organized by the state, not being directed by the state. As Marxists, I think we're prone to sort of swinging a pendulum very decisively towards the sort of structural reading mm. of histories, right? So yeah, sure, like individual people did this, individual people did that, but if they hadn't, someone else would have. And I'm sort of interested in whether or not you think that as a consequence of that, as a consequence of this particular kind of ownership structure that we have now, that the individual proclivities of particular capitalists, Elon Musk most prominently of all, now start to matter again in a broad historical sense, not because of the great man theory of history, but in fact sort of because of the opposite of it, because people are able to gain control over what are in fact broad distributed, massively impersonal systems, but nevertheless they're able to sort of, you know, become dominant over them in, 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 in quite a new kind of sense. Are we swinging back towards a sort of a great man theory of history moment when you know, Elon Musk personally matters? I don't know about great man history, theory of history, but I think that you really hit the nail on the head, which is that we have this structural turn towards individuals, which is hard to think of. Um, Melinda Cooper is someone who's done like really good work on this question. Um, and what she argues is that like what we call the neoliberal period um, in which market values come to dominate uh, in every aspect of society actually ends up promoting family structures and individual patriarchal authority rather than undermining it. Because when you, when you take out the government support that is trying to create some sort of equality, what you have left is this family form of production, family form of ownership, um, the patriarchal form of, uh, of corporate control. And so you see like literally family controlled companies uh, rising, something like, you know, LMVH or whatever. And Bechtel is another one that's played a really important role in California history. Um, and Bolivian history. Absolutely global history uh, and global present, but is a family controlled private company. But then you also see these pseudo private companies that are technically public companies, but because of the way they've changed ownership structures, um, they operate more like, uh, you know, patrimonially, right? Um, and so it, it's hard to sort of square that circle, but I think history has done a really good job of it for us, right? Of uh, back to this idea of the individual capitalist, but really only as a solution uh, to this historical problem of organizing capital itself. It's not like, oh, we all found family values and now like we want, corporate leaders who embody those family values or like Mark Zuckerberg is such a great guy, so powerful in his individual intellect that he has accumulated all this wealth and power around him. And he is Caesar Augustus or whatever. Mm. And like, even though that might be like what he thinks about himself, uh, it's not the case. It, it, rather, these individuals have become very useful tools for a system. I mean, perhaps not Mark Zuckerberg, who looks, at least in his recent sort of like transformation to be not trying to be Caesar Augustus, maybe more Chet Hanks, which is not quite the person <laughs> I think he might want to become. But um, definitely Donald Trump embodies this sort of patrimonial uh, domination and the kind of the, 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 the main man of a family and that, that sort of family business dynamic. Speaking of, of dads, now this is a tenuous link. Speaking of dads, I do want to ask a question about Kamala Harris's father, who was uh, one of the first black tenured professors at Stanford University, which plays a sort of central role, the university does, in your, your overall picture of uh, the transformations of, of, of Paolo Alto. Um, the question is, what should we make of, is there anything to say about Kamala Harris? Or is she sort of a, an entirely sort of born again 
uh, corporate Democrat whose history is sort of entirely irrelevant to her because she simply embodies, in the same kind of way as other people do, a, a sort of mere avatar for a wider system. Yeah, I mean, I think we can understand her story as part of this like larger story, right? It's like her parents um, both immigrated to the United States and to the Bay Area in particular at a time when there was huge growth in the Bay Area. Uh, where that was a very exciting place to move and where it was uh, not just uh, accumulating, but also accepting uh, immigrants from various parts of the world. And I don't want to make it sound also like individual people are, are simply subject to these economic forces because throughout this whole history of California, there have also been leftists who have said, I'm going to escape whatever situation I'm in and go to California and hide out or go to California and organize there um, because it's because it's the edge of the world or because it's somewhere different or because it's somewhere where I feel like I might have a more space to do my work. Um, and so they were coming into a, a like very developed political ferment, um, especially at UC Berkeley, which is where her parents met at the, the African American Association, out of which the black power politics really emerge as much there as pretty much anywhere. Um, and so obviously children don't just like assume the politics of their parents, right? We're not just like uh, outcomes of that. It's worth noting that uh, Donald Harris didn't play a like major role in raising Kamala and her mm -hmm. sister, I don't think. Uh, his work is interesting. I was sad actually that I didn't get to write about him and I just couldn't fit it in the book because he's a, a very interesting theorist and his writing, especially about like post-colonial uh, challenges is, is, I think, very interesting and maybe should be like read more often. Uh, but it's not, it's not a coincidence or a surprise that these left-wing immigrants, these very skilled, very talented, um, brilliant left-wing immigrants from very different places in the world end up in the Bay Area um, and have a child there who then also becomes successful um, by these standards. So... One of one of the many stories that create the fabric of Northern California, but one that definitely f is not exceptional or not like uh, different than a number of different patterns that we've seen. And it would be interesting thinking now about if, if Kamala Harris had been born 10 or 15 years later, what industry would she be in? Would she have gone into law? Like, I don't know. Probably not. Like, you could see her in, in tech or something, right? Um I think like law at the time when she went into it uh, played a certain role in the political imaginary for liberals about like uh, human rights. Uh, human rights says was a better way to think about global progress and how you can make a change. And that was organized very legalistically as opposed to politically. Uh, my friend Salar Mohandisi has a really good book about this called uh, From Anti-Imperialism to Human Rights, I believe, that tackles this period uh, and that shift very specifically and sort of explains the difference in politics, I think, from Kamala Harris's parents to, to her attempt to like enact her own liberalism. Do you think tech should play that role in our imagination of the, the progress of history? No, God, no. Uh, no, it's terrible. And I think that uh, our understanding of that has advanced over the past 10, 15 years, right? So if Kamala Harris was an, were an 18-year-old right now who was trying to make a difference in the world, I don't think she would be going into tech, right? And I think that the, the idealistic young people who want to make a difference understand that tech is not an open field politically for them to uh, change things. Um, you have to go about nine minutes, is that right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to do something very unusual for Navarro FM, which is I'm going to ask you a series of sort of like quick fire questions. Ooh, um, that sounds Those fun. questions uh, in, in a sort of like a help me pick some stocks kind of way. Oh, okay. So, um, and I want to just like think about a collection of technological developments that are very much on the horizon, right? Because in some ways... Silicon Valley is the place in the world where the future matters most in that uh, the future determines what will happen now in this sort of the strongest possible sense, both financially in that people are locked into various kinds of um, structures of debt and obligation that they can't get out of, but also because almost all technologies are not yet finished. Right? And almost all technologies can be iterated and further developed. And so I want to think about some of the sort of the key ones um, 
ranging from very, very controversial to, to sort of slightly less controversial, um, and get your sort of takes on them or your sense of how they play a part in that overall Californian story, both now and going into the future. And the first one is cryptocurrencies. Like, what do you make of cryptocurrencies? They seem to be this attempt to depoliticize money that ultimately ends up further deepening the politicization of, of money and uh, turning the questions of you know, issuance, which is what the Bitcoin white paper is ultimately uh, sort of first about, into questions that are deeply frighted and deeply kind of complicated by patterns of like particular interest. And so I'm wondering what your sort of general take on cryptocurrencies are. Yeah, if I can throw in NFTs, because uh, I think they're part of the same thing. Well, they're the same, the same technology, right? Blockchain technologies, yeah. Yeah, and I can and I can get a like a, a real like specific uh, answer because I think a lot of it, and the reason maybe they're still around, is that the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz realized yeah. that it provided a way around limits on the venture capital investment form, which is that you can't cash out your investment at the same time as you make it. You have to wait <laughs> and assume the liabilities of an investment. You can't just cash in on the hype of making an investment. Uh, for a company that's not actually worth anything yet, unless the company is making NFTs or cryptocurrency or whatever. And so it's what it really ends up being uh, is a second set of shares that investors own that they can sell immediately, as opposed to restricted stock that they have to sit on and watch the hype die down. And that's been incredible. That itself as a technology is incredibly valuable for those VCs, for those investors, and no one else. It serves mm. no other, it's a, it's a financial purpose. Um, so it's a, it's a con, it's a really good con for those people, but that, that's what it is. That's a really good answer. That's a really uh, incisive uh, reading of NFTs. The second technology is AGI. Fake. I'll go, I'll go even further. I, I, what is intelligence? If you research the history of intelligence, which I have in, detail uh it's fake there is no such thing <laughs> like intelligence researchers will tell you there is no such thing as a unitary measure of intelligence so that the idea that we could like connect a bunch of computer computer chips and then like god will pop out is a like idealistic philosophical position that i think is like simply wrong like like i think like sam altman is a like weird hegelian who thinks that they are like assembling god by wiring enough computer chips together. And I think that is simply false. Weird Hegelian is not the description that I've often I've come across before, but um, happy to hear it. You heard it here first. Uh, and the, the third tech is climate technology, geoengineering. It strikes me that climate change is not going to be solved. Uh, and therefore, geoengineering is almost certainly going to happen. Climate tech is, I read this morning uh, from the Silicon Valley Bank's uh, report on the matter, actually quite a big growth industry, uh, pretty resilient to the sort of downturn we've seen in the last two years as interest rates rose. Tell me about climate tech. We'll see. I mean, I, investors, uh, Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley like VC scene or whatever likes to talk about that stuff a lot. But in terms of where they're actually putting their money, it's not, especially not in the like experimental uh, like climate solutions, really, really not over there. Uh, especially the ones that have the most ability to like impact overall emissions. Instead, they've in invested in like 30 scooter companies, right? And they call that climate tech. Uh, like huge, huge amounts of money in scooter companies, like way, way more than they've put into like, you know, food system tech, which is where we really need a lot of innovation. Um, and I think that's, it's because they're, driven by where they think they can not just make money, uh, but blow up a stock in the near term. And some of these other things are just too risky and the Silicon Valley finance systems are not set up to take advantage of them. They're not set up to support uh, these kinds of technologies. And in fact, they're been relatively risk averse when it comes to climate tech and the kinds of climate tech that we actually need, um, which is, I think less sexy than some of the things that they they want to talk about. They've invested tons in fake meat companies, right? But not in like food waste um, solutions. Uh, so I think they they're dealing with a set of motives that are not pushing them in the right direction, and that's a good example. I mean, Elon Musk is a good example when you think of his like the tunnel company or right, right whatever well, the boring company that he was going to do. That's climate tech, right? 
the transportation sector is somewhere we need like really, really big, uh, important answers to changing the way we operate if we're going to reduce our emissions. And instead, he's like, instead of trains, we could just put cars in a tunnel and they could go faster. And this hasn't actually happened, but it has stalled the growth of public transit and like blunted the the need for actual solutions um, within the sector. And all the way to the bank, right? He's He has uh, been advantaged by this, especially as the country's largest purveyor of electric vehicles, uh, personal electric vehicles, let's say. Uh, mm. Go ahead. And it's also worth saying that Elon Musk's, uh, that Tesla itself uh, benefited enormously and still benefits from a particular piece of California legislation that forces other car companies or car companies in general to sell electric vehicles. And then Tesla simply uh, profits from other car companies failing to make enough vehicles because they can then uh, give those to Tesla and Tesla can, can cash them in. Um, fourth technology is UBI. Yeah. I think UBI and the tech industry's interest in UBI has to be read um, in this history of sort of utopian economic solutions that come from the top. Uh, because I, though there have been various like grassroots attempts to secure uh, basic income for the working class, I think what we see in Silicon Valley is really a sort of like Sim City attempt to reduce labor capital conflict by capital. And you can see that all the way back to, you know, Leland Stanford, the arch capitalist founder of Palo Alto, exploiter of the railroad workers, whatever, also liked to write nice pamphlets about how we should try like cooperative industry. And he was like a, a big proponent of cooperatives, right? And it's like, well, you can't be a big proponent of cooperatives while being a capitalist. Thank you so much. Uh, it's Malcolm Harris. Please adjust your stock portfolios appropriately. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Support independent journalism and set up a regular donation to Navara Media from just £1 a month. Head to navara.media forward slash support or face the consequences.